Hope everyone's doing great this morning. I am Amanda McAllister, Creative Director at Change Up. Thanks for the intro, Jason. Um, so we are a brand experience agency. We've met with a few of you lovely folks. Um, but we specialize in retail design. So this topic is so crucial to what we do. Um, you know, I think retail, as we all know, it's seen a lot of forced innovation, right? Over the pandemic, it's, you know, for good or bad. There's a lot that's gone on. I think we've learned that, you know, consumers are uh, pretty quick to learn, pretty eager to evolve with the brand. But with that, you know, what innovations are truly worth continuing to invest in for the long haul? So today we're going to chat through that. I have some lovely guests with me. So I'm going to let them kind of speak to their exciting projects. But kind of one by one, we've got Nick Welts, Senior Director of Store Development and Construction at Green Thumb Industries. We've got Scott Fournier, VP of Real Estate Development and Facility Ops at Discount Tire. And then Jessica Ichu, VP of Branch Experience Design at Citizens. You guys want to kind of each maybe give us a quick intro, chat through your maybe most exciting projects or initiatives that you're working on, and then we'll dig into some kind of specific topics. Sure. Hi, I'm Nick, uh, Green Thumb Industries. Uh, we are a, what I work on anyway is, is the retail side of our business, um, cannabis dispensaries. Um, we've been undertaking a massive project to reimagine what our retail footprint or, or our retail store looks like um, within regulations, of course. And uh, it's been an exciting. Uh, it's been an exciting 18 months that we've been working on it now, um, and and getting ready to open the the first one, uh, the first reimagined one uh, before the end of the year. Thanks, Amanda. Awesome. All right, how you doing, Scott Fournier here, and uh, really representing the real estate development side of things, which has changed so much over the past several years. Really getting more into innovation and partnering with our experience group as well. Our legacy design used to be, here's a box, go figure it out operations, but now we are one of the main groups implementing this type of um, technology changes into the stores and how do we roll it out to 1,100 plus locations. So it's very exciting. There's a new new store concept opening on the 28th uh, later this month. It's called Pit Pass, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. So very exciting. I'll probably talk about that for a little too long, so sorry about <laughs> that in advance, but I'll pass it along to uh, Jessica. Hi everyone, Jessica Itchu with Citizens. Um, I'm Branch Experience Design on the Retail Network Transformation Team for Citizens. Um, so I manage everything from programming and design and visioning new formats for our transformation program. Um, primarily focused on right now uh, coming up with new prototypes and branch pilots in terms of technology and unique formats. Um, and really working on a lot of integration design um, as we go through some acquisitions and most recently working through a new uh, mobile branch concept. Great, thanks guys. So I think you know a, a general theme we've heard uh, throughout the conference and we'll continue to hear, right, is this idea of tech versus uh, you know, a human experience, right? So I think as we look at all of the force innovation that has happened through uh, you know, delivery, service models, um, certainly advanced tech, but curious what you guys are um, really banking on like for the future like there's so many channels now for consumers to engage with brands to you know receive products and services what are you kind of really you know oh this is one that's going to stick around hopefully for the long haul that you're kind of putting all your eggs in the basket of for me to go Anyone, yeah. <laughs> it's a loaded that. question. Yeah. I'll give it, yeah. Go ahead, take um, For us, uh, obviously, um, the business that we're in is a little bit different than, uh, call it traditional retail. Um, we can have drive throughs we can do delivery, depending on the state. Um, really leaning into that, especially coming out of the pandemic, as, as I, I think everyone is. Um, but reimagining what not just the front of house looks like in our store, but also the back of house. Um, how are we servicing uh, a drive-through? How are we servicing um, delivery drivers that are coming in, whether it's third party or our own? Um, so to your point, 
very much leaning into technology, pre-orders, all, all of these things. Uh, it, it's the same for us, but how do we provide the same experience? Um, perhaps most importantly in the back of the house uh, yeah. than, than the, the patient or customer that's coming through the door. Well, especially, I mean, speaking to consistency and a consistent experience, cannabis has so many regulations and it's yeah. different per region, per state. Are you finding that that's been increasingly difficult to maintain kind of a, a consistent customer experience or you're able to at least streamline that back of house it, enough? It's not increasingly difficult, it's just always difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Um, but uh, again, depending on the state, um, it, it's, a ch it, it's definitely a challenge, um, but it's one that we can overcome uh, with our people, right? And, and that's true of anyone. Uh, provide a great experience, whether it's through a, a drive-up window or delivery or, or in the store. Um, it's, it's always difficult, but sure. the people help. Great. Scott, you guys are abound with innovation these days. How do you kind of sort through what to really lean into, especially for Pit Pass? It's been uh, very difficult actually uh, trying to implement because so much of what we do is based on the customer experience. We're very customer obsessed and really providing that unexpected visit where it really leaves that lingering impression with them. And so as we're moving to technology, uh, how do we still keep it personable and blend that so it's that seamless experience, it's frictionless, uh, the omni-channel experience, whether you're on a mobile app or a desktop website, how does that compare to the store? So we've been developing personas so people can pick their uh, tires based on uh, their driving habits and really moving into a BOPIS-based and appointment-based because it'll help smooth out demand. With our pit pass location, we were somewhat forced into innovation because of space limitations. Um, it's a smaller format of a store on a smaller piece of property. And by going that direction, we believe it's going to open up hundreds of new locations for us or potential locations where we otherwise wouldn't be. This is it right here. Um, this is a picture from last week. It, like I said, it's opening up on 28th. And what makes this experience so different is this is an appointment-based store only, and there's zero inventory in there. So it's going to be nightly deliveries for replenishment. So when we had this uh, challenge laid forth, it was really company-wide type of initiative to uh, make something like this work because uh, we could only be within 50 miles of one of our distribution centers in order to succeed with that. And so this whole thing is driven with technology from internal to external. So as customers make their appointments, they select their tires online and go through the BOPIS experience. When they show up at the site, there's the geofencing with it as well. And so then, hey, Scott, please pull into lane number two. So it's kind of directs over that. So as you pull into lane two, there's a drive over tread depth reader. So it tells you the current... Um, healthier tires, and we have a monolith there as well, where it can mirror onto the customer's uh, phone as well, or smart device. So that way they can also do the purchase there. So if they did, were driving up, uh, not knowing what we we're doing. So this is Pit Pass by Discount Tire. It's that NASCAR feel. Try to get you in and out in less than 20 minutes. Uh, so what's really good from the labor efficiency side of it is now the customer's bringing the vehicle to us for anybody who's been to a Discount Tire. We typically walk back out to the car, take some measurements on tire, get the mileage, that type of thing, walk back in the store. So there's just a lot of inefficiencies, but this is really going to help drive us into those areas where we otherwise wouldn't be. So much technology has been included in that. It's that NASCAR pit stop experience. We have equipment on the sides of the vehicle. You just kind of continue driving through from the canopy into the main building. Uh, lots of stuff going on there. And really, it just starts with the customer um, when they're sitting on their couch or whatever at home, going through Treadwell, one of our, uh, it's helping pick out the tires and the persona, that type of thing. So from the technology piece, that's also where it's the most interesting of trying to implement it so our people aren't fearful too. And they're just like, are we just becoming advisors? Do we just sit side by side? Are we walking through and through how to use the website? What's the deal with that? So it is... Um, it's a challenge and operations is having a different mindset with it as well, but a lot of good collaboration going on and we're breaking down some of the silos that we had within the company sometimes too. So is it fair to say though that the uh, investment in the tech, the innovation, this sort of new model for you guys was maybe offset by the, the land savings and some of the reduction in square footage or? Yeah, there's a, a lot of money that's been going into technology which 
Um, the amount of time that it's taken as well, that's kind of the driver for getting the store open. That's one of the rare occasions where we have the store with a CFO in hand and uh, people aren't waiting on us to get it open and start making some money. But yeah, it, it's been a very heavy investment, especially over the last uh, 18, 24 months. Uh, lots of innovation. Our IT group has been kind of going crazy and trying to get in the queue for the di different initiatives that we have with it. And it's going to be critically important because the money that we spent into that technology and getting BOPIS and appointments set up in our scheduling system internally, um, that'll, that'll smooth out demand so that we are uh, staffed appropriately as well. We don't have people standing around when we're not busy and then we're not behind the schedule as well if um, we get slammed with uh, ten tons of people at one time or it's an hour and a half, two hour wait. So it's a huge difference because um, you know, tires, they're just not very sexy. You're kind of forced into it. And we, we've talked about if you go to some place like a, a Nordstrom, you'll spend $1,000 there and you're going to be very well taken care of. Well, that discount tire, you'll spend $1,000 there too. So it's like, why don't we have that mindset as well to really take care of the customer and invest in it. So from that technology piece, by spending less time in the store, they're going to be happier with the different personas. There's people who don't want to talk to anybody. There's still people who want to talk to. So we're really trying to adjust for that as well. And uh, it's been a very, very healthy investment on that side of things. Love that Nordstrom comparison. So true. Jessica, banking. <laughs> it's kind of a wild world. What are you guys, what are you up to? What are you seeing as are the innovations that you're, you're driving, that consumers are really wanting? How's that shifted for you guys over the past few years? Yeah, and I think your question earlier, what, what channels are you banking on? I think it rings true in banking. Everybody kind of has this position or they're unsure about banking, whether or not the physical bank branch is going to be around for the long time, or people always say to me, you know, aren't you closing a bunch of branches or decreasing your branches? And we don't necessarily feel that way. We, you know, truly believe that the bank branch is here to stay for the long term. Maybe it'll look a little bit different, or maybe you have to drive 10 minutes instead of five minutes to get to your nearest branch. But we're really trying to focus on the experience in branch and make it worthwhile for a customer to come into us. So investing in technology that really teaches our customers and trains our customers how to move easy transactions to digital. So for example, you know, depositing your check on your phone takes two seconds at home versus having to come into the branch and talk to somebody. Saves you time, saves us time as well. Now that freed up that you know, 15 minute transaction where we can actually invest that time back into our customers to provide the advice that they're actually looking for. So we find, especially in our younger customers, surprisingly, who are super digitally engaged, that they feel more financially confident if they come into a branch and there is a branch in their neighborhood. They know they can come and talk to financial experts in their community. So we're really trying to focus on investing in technology that frees up our people's time to give that good advice in the branch. Sometimes it does mean maybe removing a teller line and adding back some other type of technology to provide virtual access to advisors. Maybe the FA is not there that day, but we can conference you in. Um, you know, a lot of times we're switching up how we're providing a service. So if we maybe removed a teller, maybe we can add that back in with a virtual assistant somehow and still give you that transactional need if you come in for that today. But maybe it's in a different way than you're accustomed to. So we're really trying to focus on providing the same customer service level that they're accustomed to um, in a typical branch space. Even in things like you know, people check in at their dentist and they check in on a tablet. And it's a super quick experience. It's slick. Um, we want to be able to provide that same type of experience when you come to your bank as well. That's great. Yeah, so just kind of pivoting and giving back time where it makes sense, but still providing the same, same services you've, you've been providing in just a unique, different way. Love that. Yeah, uh, to that uh, yeah please. Well, to your point, that extra 30, 45 seconds just to talk to the customer, if you get a little bit of that automation through technology, then the information is there so you're not, for us, it's not running around the vehicle. It's time spent where then we can kind of show them the condition of it and actually have a uh, nice little short conversation with it and instead of just wondering what's going right, it's on. It's more valuable conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little nuggets of information. Which I think speaks so much to the shift that we're seeing right now in um, really like what hospitality means. Um, I think, you know, we've been trained to think of hospitality as, you know, a smiling face behind a counter, right? And often that's actually quite a barrier for customers or um, especially with younger generations, maybe they, you know, don't necessarily want that. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's again, this balance between tech and human, but 
curious, um, you know, if we can give back time in a certain way or have more meaningful conversations with our customers, um, is that not also a form of hospitality, but almost facilitated through tech? Uh, I'm curious if you guys, you know, have any additional uh, kind of thoughts on that or ways that you're boosting uh, maybe what's otherwise thought of as like traditional hospitality in your experiences. When we first had this conversation, I loved the way that you used the word hospitality because we kind of talk about this but maybe hadn't thought about it with that exact word and I think it's a really great point. Um, I think across the board in banking and in other retailers, people are moving towards a concierge concept. So somebody smiling face at the door to greet you, but not just that, right? We want to check you into your appointment, schedule your appointment, move you to where you need to go and give you that good experience. Um, and making sure that it's seamless with the omni-channel, right? So making sure that if you started something at home, couldn't figure it out, came into the branch, we know what you're talking about when you get there, um, and can be able to provide that slick experience when you walk through the door as well. Great. For us, that's been one of our big challenges, kind of navigating through the pandemic a little bit too. We've incorporated our curbside greeter, and as we did that, really when we're still looking at some site designs, people have taken the initiative in the stores to reconfigure the parking lot because we do want to get them going on their journey. So if we can funnel in, that's the nice thing with Pit Pass, everybody's kind of coming under that canopy. So what, what brings you in here today? And um, you know, there's the different personas of, I don't want to talk to anybody, I need full service. And so we just start them on that journey, um, walk them through, get them on the wait list. So if there is a line inside the showroom, it is different. But uh, it's, I think it really starts for us there. Once they enter the parking lot, because we had some stuff where we were talking about it like, oh, we're going to meet the customer in the parking lot. Is that when they're walking in the front door? It's like, no, we're going to meet them at the vehicle. So mm -hmm. they kind of know where to go in the first place because we also have um, free air checks and the line is usually at the end of the building. And so we'll walk them to the showroom, get back and, back and forth. So just step one is taking care of them, send them on the right direction. Yeah, love that. I think to your point, Amanda, what we talk about a lot internally in, in hospitality can mean a lot of different things. We talk about meeting people where they are, mm. right? Um, so we have plenty of, of patients and customers that come into our stores that have pre-ordered or they're going to a kiosk and know exactly what they want and they're going to go to the POS and they're, they're going to get out and that's it. And then we have folks who are new to cannabis and don't know anything and are, are patient care specialists, um, our employees are having that 15, 20, 30 minute conversation, educating them, um, this, is what, this is what this will do, this is the, you know, the, ex the experience, the effect you will have. Um, but not trying to put everyone in the same bin, yeah. right, to your point. Um, hospitality can mean a lot of different things. And so hospitality for the person who has the pre-order they want to get out, in and out, that's it. And that's, that's meaningful to them, that we can provide that transaction, that fast transaction time. Um, and, and then the other person, they want to spend a half an hour. We have to be able to, we have to, be able to do both uh, within the same environment. How do you like balance that though and prioritize? Because I think, you know, as we, I, I'm sure we're all very familiar with this idea of, you know, you can't be everything for everyone. Uh, if, you, if you have a, a true consumer base or you know really who your target customer is, that's great. But often mm -hmm. we don't get that lucky. We really are designing and trying to adapt for truly everyone. Uh, curious if, you know, you've talked about, a lot about your uh, tech advances and back of house and trying to streamline operations. But when it comes to that front of house experience, are you, um, is it kind of a 50-50 where you're, you, you're truly pushing for this consumer versus this? Or are you leaning kind of one way or the other? Um, we don't lean one way or the other. Um, of course, for for us and the the industry is still in its relative infancy. Yeah. Um, for us, education is huge um, because that that person that comes in for the thirty minute consultation and, and visit their first time might be the one that comes in and just punches on the kiosk the next time and just wants to get out because mm -hmm. now we know everything. Um, it's, it's a delicate balance, um, and it's really hard for training. Fortunately, I don't have to do that. <laughs> um, but uh, 
we're able to devote enough um, enough people in the store um, to be able to have that conversation. It, it's we can't not do it. I guess is my answer to your question. Yeah, <laughs> is we have to have those conversations with those folks and uh, labor wise, it's it's very difficult, but. Um, we uh, we actively try to uh, be able to do both, and to your point, um, have to design our stores in a way that uh, we have pre-order express lines, right? If you order online, you come in, you go straight to the straight to the desk. Um, it, I don't know if I've answered your question, but it's it's hard. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, yeah, that absolutely fits the bill. And um, I'm curious, so with pre-order express lines, with, um, you know, it, new services, with pit pass, with, you know, drive up, drive through, um, trying to reduce square footage, you know, rising building costs are such a huge issue right now. Um, what are you, I guess, what, what ways are you guys looking at to, um, kind of decrease maybe your spend or reallocate your space um, in a way that, that still keeps up with the customer experience but maybe saves you a little on the end or even just thinking about like, you know, do we need all this inventory? Can we, you know, decrease in size or, or what do people, what do our consumers actually really need out of a branch? Does our, our space currently, you know, our footprint, does that fit the bill. Um, have you had? Have you had started to have these conversations? Are you activating on things? Just curious how that's going because <laughs> it's a huge thing we we consistently hear. Yeah, I think half of what we talk about is the fun, sexy stuff, and half of it is how can you do it for cheaper. So yeah, I think we we all have those conversations, but I think it happens in a lot of ways, right? Some of it is being super strategic about which branches you are investing in. You're always going to have those couple of branches. You know, for us, it's typically one or two in the major metros that are our big, flashy flagship branches that have everything you can possibly imagine in it. And then kind of stepping down from there, depending on the market and the customer base and demographics and being really smart about where we're investing, how we're investing. Um, the size helps a lot, of course, and technology is enabling us to move smaller in specific areas. Um, you know, I'll use the same example as I did earlier. You know, providing one ITM it, with access to Citizens Virtual Assistant is much smaller and more economical than building four teller stations with all that square footage and staffing it. It's um, a much more economical way to do it. And that's a pretty apples to apples experience? <clears throat> I think once you get used to it, it definitely is. Um, we're just kind of in the, I would say, mid pilot stage of rolling out ITMs. We've seen a lot of other credit unions and other types of banks doing it um, kind of even before us. And we kind of took a strategic position to kind of wait and see how that went and kind of pick up some of those um, changes. So we're doing them in very specific and strategic areas, um, not just always, it's not a one for one ratio. Um, interestingly enough, we're kind of seeing our older demographics adopt it more than we would have imagined. Um, we're getting some really fun verbatims like this was like using a spaceship or <laughs> things like that. So I think there's not as much pushback as you would think, but getting back to your hospitality point, we're not just saying there's the ITM, go figure it out. One of our concierge or lobby leaders, we call them, is walking the customer over to it and teaching them how to use it, introducing them to the virtual assistant. So it is a digital experience, but truly still has that physical human interaction as well. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I guess for us, uh, there's obviously the value engineering that goes along with the building. We're going to go test some materials or do something, and then we'll try to dial, it in, dial that in as time goes on. But the big thing is, if we're going to spend that money up front, the question is going to be why. And it starts, at, when we think about it, it's from the labor perspective as well. So that way, if we can reduce headcount by one or even repurpose them, that's going to make a, a bigger difference, um, and that's why we might want to incorporate the canopy. We're going to spend money to do that. Historically, if you go to some of our legacy locations, we don't have that, but we're seeing the benefit of that. It improves safety as well because if we detach like the air checks away from the building, people can get in and out quicker. They're not crossing in front of the base, so it creates a safer environment as well. Um, the other piece, and I think I might be kind of going off in a little direction here too, 
is we have something called RoboTire. It's a new piece of technology that we're testing in the Phoenix area. And it's kind of um, like what you'd find at a car manufacturing plant where there's the assembly line side of it where this machine will actually take the tires and wheels off the vehicle. It'll change the tires as well, put them back on the vehicle. And you're going, well, why, why do you need that? Well, it's not replacing people from the robotic standpoint, but we're kind of calling it the cobotics where our person is still going to be um, the one working the, the touch screen to make sure that everything happens and they're overseeing the situation. But it's going to reduce the uh, amount of injuries and you know back issues, things like that, is lifting up some of these 40, 50 pound assemblies. So from, from a labor standpoint, we're making the investment up front because that's a one-time investment, whereas with labor, that's the annual cost associated just to run the store. So if, if we're meeting people at the vehicle, if the customer's moving the vehicle around the parking lot, that's times when we're not running back and forth, wasting minutes throughout the day. So it, it makes sense for us to spend a little bit more to get that layout so our people are happy too because then they're less tired by the end of the day, they're underneath the canopy, otherwise it'd be in the, in the sun, rain or snow as the year goes on. So it's uh, employee and customer experience is the main driver for it while keeping labor efficiency in mind. Just huge. I mean, we've had such an awakening over the past few years yeah. about, you know, it, labor and employees, right? Like, you're, <laughs> you're only going to be as good as, as the people running your, your spaces. And I, it's, I know it's a big thing that um, our clients are, you know, consistently, all right, we've got to keep our people happy. How are we going to do this? So the fact that you know, you guys were able to be so preemptive about uh, including a lot of those those assets into your new um, new designs is is huge. So and it's hard to find labor right now too. So we got to keep the ones. That we have. <laughs> yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Curious, Nick. I know space usage is a big one for you guys, as you've got a lot of zoning and uh, different kind of footprints that you're trying to get into at all times. Nothing's ever kind of the same. How's that going? Um, what are you seeing? Uh... Yeah, for us, it's a, we have to deal with the state that's always looking at the cameras in our stores. Yeah. Um, and keeping our people happy, you know, as Scott said. Um, we're doing a lot of work internally on, um, on what does our ideal footprint look like? And I, I realize that may sound a little silly, but again, we're, you know, we're seven years in um, as a company and, and the industry in its infancy. So uh, doing that within the regulations that the states place upon us um, and keeping people happy, uh, tons, of, tons of how do we make the transaction for the person, as I said earlier, that's coming in and just wants to get in and get out. Yeah. How do we make that um, faster, quite frankly, um, and, and still provide the environment for the person that wants the, the 15, 20, 30 minute conversation? Um, what we found is um, the, the back of the house, um, we can, we can, we're, we're shrinking, um, and smaller actually makes our people happier. Um, we're, you know, pedometers, how many steps are people taking? What, what does it take for a person to get from here to here to okay. complete this transaction? Um, and at the end of the day, what it's all adding up to is where you started that, um, it's not just build out cost. It's not um, it's not schedule time for a construction project. It's it's the occupancy, um, and we're all looking at that, right? So yeah, I'm curious. Do you feel like there's a um, like a break point in innovation, or maybe like something you've maybe thought about, or like oh man, that's going to be too far, or that's going to really take the consumer out of their element? Because again, I think. We've seen that consumers are quick to learn and, and mm -hmm. they're ready to go along for the journey with us. But um, I, we often talk about, all right, what is the, the right amount of innovation and yeah. change so that we don't really lose the identity of, of the experience itself and throw people for a total loop? Kind of wondering if any of you have experienced that so far. We haven't gotten there yet, Yeah. Um, thankfully. <laughs> um, but... Uh, I, 
we all have Google reviews and, and people giving us feedback all the time, right? So um, we're not immune to that. Uh, I had a terrible experience. All you wanted to do was push me out the door. Um, so it, it, it is a difficult balance because people want that, but then obviously other groups that don't. So yeah. um, I, I think that we've still got a lot of room uh, for innovation and doing something new. And as laws change in the business that we're in, um, that, only, that only unlocks more opportunities. Yeah. I think for us what becomes challenging is we have 1,100 existing stores and a lot of them are building takeovers as well. So the footprint's not always the same. It's a different configuration. So as we have this new piece of technology, it's going to be fantastic in the new store that we just built. But how do we deliver that same type of experience in an existing store? And then we have some that are like neighborhood stores versus a flagship store. So the just the sheer volume of customers is different. There's stores where we do double the business and it's the same size footprint in the building. So what works for them and what doesn't work. Uh, another piece that we've been kind of doing too uh, is taking off in it. And I'll go back to 2003, 4, 5. We tried a mobile technology where we would actually go to somebody's place of business or their house. And at the time, people weren't quite equipped with the, or we didn't do a good job of marketing. Um, and we didn't have it on the website where we could really showcase it and talk about it in the stores. Uh, so that went away in 2005 or six. It only lasted a few years, but here we are now. Uh, we've dusted it off, and <laughs> we've, we've got some of the mobile units back in place. And especially as people are looking for time back in their day, it's been a different value uh, going through the pandemic of what they're looking for and how they want to spend their time. So if we can go to them, it, it makes it all that much better. Um, so t technology also needs to be uh, introduced to the customer in a very good way so they'd be willing to adapt it because we could have it and it'll just be sitting there but people don't know about it so we really rely on our folks in the stores as well to help showcase that and trying to drive uh, customer behaviors in that direction so we, we had some rebate programs and we've kind of reduced the amount that we've been using and instead if you go this direction and set up on our website with the my garage feature that type of thing you get 10 percent off tires so that's how we're investing that money as well to drive them into that direction. But uh, yeah, the pivoting with the technology and, and making sure people are aware of it and then how to use it because we've had a couple iterations on our app. People don't want to use it, but if you go this direction, you have the app, then you get the geofencing. So there's a lot of benefits to doing it, but the educational piece is big too. I think to that point, as we think about like a seamless experience, right? It, it, you know, there is an inherent um, just understanding of how to use most tech these days, but then mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that don't have that understanding, and I think we often get caught up in like, all right, what is the right messaging or the right amount of instruction or you know facilitation that's that's required for this this certain element? Um, so I mean, that's that's a big one. I feel like we run into all the time is is not over explaining something and looking like you know. <laughs> a bunch of grandmas up here like yeah mm -hmm, we get it <laughs> but also not leaving people out kind of in the dust to figure it out on their own curious is, is are people pretty adapt at kind of figuring out what to do or is there a lot of facilitation still happening uh, it definitely depends part of it too is training the colleagues um, making sure that they really understand the equipment mm -hmm. or understand the why behind why we're giving them the equipment um, with 1100 branches and relatively high turnover rates in some of the you know, younger roles, we find that they don't understand necessarily why we're giving them the equipment. So in turn, our customers aren't getting that point as well. So really making sure that we have a robust training program and really kind of coaching the colleagues as to why we're giving them this technology. Um, for the most part, customers are used to seeing technology in other places, so they're relatively receptive to seeing it in branches as long as we're not taking something away. That's the big piece of customer feedback that we get is if we're adding technology that doesn't replace a service that they're accustomed to, they're very upset about it. So for example, drive up tellers, removing a drive up teller service. Now the mom with a stroller and four kids has to come in the front door. If we could provide that service in a different way, perhaps with technology, as long as they can still get that same 
level of service in a different way, they're pretty okay with the technology component of it. Hmm. I think you're spot on with the internal piece of it too. And it's just training our people on how to use it because a very traditional pen and pad for us, but then you don't get the information that you need for the customer, nor does it get logged and you can't track. We're even just trying to figure out how many customers come through um, the parking lot in the store every day, but we didn't have a piece to do that. And I remember in one of our meetings, our customer experience uh, group, they're just like, you, you guys have this piece of technology. Nobody else has it. We can lead the industry with it. Why aren't you using it? Like, it was it friendly enough for our people to use it as well? So uh, there's the training piece to it and mm -hmm. really understanding how, how we can leverage it and why we actually took the time to build it. Um, it's a big component to it too. Yeah. I think too, like, I mean, the idea of we're always kind of designing for, we don't want to take away services, right? We don't want to have, you know, there might be one person that's walking through your space that needs this one specific thing a day, whereas all 99% of the rest of your customers might be fully on board with something else. How, how are you balancing, um, you know, for instance, a, a really traditional like POS moment where it could easily be a kiosk, but maybe someone still has cash. How, do you find that you're kind of still like needing to um, accommodate for maybe people that are uh, a little behind the times and, or have you had uh, success with really kind of moving forward completely? <laughs> yeah, our colleagues are given a little bit of autonomy there to be able to do that on a one-off basis. So if somebody is very upset, they're, typically we give them the capabilities to handle that transaction in a different way. Um, it, but really just kind of talking to the customer to make sure we understand the reason behind why they're upset about this yeah. um, is important not only for that customer but for us moving forward so that we know how to kind of resolve that. Um, and sometimes, too, it depends on the market. So if it, this is happening in an urban location and they just, for whatever reason, really will never get on board with that concept, it's having the connections with the nearby branch and saying, okay, if you really need to do that, we can offer that service at, you know, whatever branch two blocks down or whatever it is. So I think there's a couple ways we can handle that, but for the most part, we got to get them on board, right? Sometimes that is their only option. So just yeah. working through that. I wonder as uh, people are, you know, Pit Pass is new, obviously. Um, we've been, ChangeUp's actually been working with Scott and team on the concept. So really excited to see how it comes to life. And uh, our team's actually there on the ground now taking pro shots. So wish we had those today, but they'll be bright and shiny in some press release soon. <laughs> yeah. But as people, you know, maybe drive up, um, it's obviously a new concept. There's a new, you know, sign with it. So they've got to know something's new about it. But as they drive up, Curious if you're um, kind of expecting pushback or if people are going to be like, heck yeah, the future, let's go. <laughs> uh, we're expecting both with it. Yeah. Um, some people are going to be really in tune to it and they've been, oh, we've been waiting for something like this forever. What's taken so long to get to this point? But then uh, we start talking about some of the fringe cases and we can't design for all of them. But uh, there's definitely going to be people who walk up and, and they're not going to understand. It's just pit pass, it's the name of the store. I didn't realize I needed an appointment. So mm. walk me through it. There's parking stalls, they're gonna park over there. They're not gonna go to the canopy. They're gonna walk around the building kind of going, where do I go? So yes, there's definitely some customer training that's gonna go on with it. Um, we've, we're doing more of the wayfinding signage on the site as well, just to kind of help direct them and have them understand uh, the flow and what we have going on because we don't have a single point of entry. There's three points of entry exit, so they can come from either direction, but to have them understand what to do, uh, not be confused with it, uh, it's a big piece to it. And then once they do get to that point, if they recognize discount tire, uh, typically we'll have three to 4,000 tires in any store so we can service them right at the same time. This is gonna be, all right, you're here today. We don't have your tires, but we'll get them uh, by tomorrow morning, you come back in, and, and because that's part of our replenishment system, so yeah, it'll be interesting to kind of go through that training process and just really drive appointments. And if there's a way that we can get them in that day, maybe they're just there for a rotation or a balance. They come in at 10 a.m. and give it pencil, penciled back in for 2 p.m. Come on back when you do. Go back through this canopy. You'll be lined up, and then you'll be in and out. And some of our rotations will be less than five minutes. So um, yeah, it is, it's interesting how that's going to go. And we're still going to have drop-offs from tow trucks. Where do we want to put in the vehicle in the lot? How do we address those situations? So there will be some of the one-offs, but one of the things uh, 
we, we could have got stuck in this design purgatory of just designing for perfection in every fringe case. So we're just like, dude, stop, stop. Let's just build the darn thing and see what the behaviors are. We've got some belt and suspenders in there where even just transacting, is it going to be at the monolith, the customer's phone? Um, one of the questions was great a few years ago. Somebody was like, yeah, but where's the cash register? Where's the till? And it's like, <laughs> well, we're trying to go away from that. It's like, yeah, but people aren't. So we, we still have that, and there's still cash transactions, and we've got to be able to take care of those customers as well. So just new behaviors and training and guiding them through. That's interesting. Yeah, there's no amount of innovation that doesn't come with some amount of pushback, certainly. Yeah. Curious, Nick, have you uh, have your customers pushed back in any way, whether it's you know the, the interaction with the product or maybe not being able to interact or methods of payment or you know all of the different ways that people have to interact with your space? Um, not a ton of pushback. We only have one method of payment. We're still we're right. entirely a cash <laughs> business. Um, don't have a choice there, unfortunately. Um, but I guess consumers don't, I mean, they have a choice within your market, but they can't, you know, sort of like your guy that you've known or, or go to <laughs> an established place and yeah. you kind of got to follow the rules, I yeah. guess. Yeah, right. All of which is still cash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so from that regard, like, we don't get much pushback because we don't have a choice. But sure. um, technology-wise, again, we, we have online pre-orders, we, uh, we have kiosks in the store. Um, in the majority of the states that we operate in, there's nothing for us to show, right? We don't have product on the shelves that you can touch and feel and smell. Some, some places we can. Yeah. Um, so there, there's a lot of education that goes on um, in those conversations with our with our employees, with uh, and and we do as much as we can uh, digitally on a on a kiosk and, and photos and, and all the information that goes along with the products. But um, as as far as pushback, I, it, it, I'll, I'll go back to the same conversation. It's it's depending on what that patient or customer wants, what they want their experience to be. Yeah. Um, we haven't experienced a ton of, uh, a, a ton of pushback in terms of utilizing technology. Great. Can I jump back in on that one? <laughs> Go right be, for it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if you had something as well. But I was actually in one of our showrooms and, and kind of showcasing some designs. And I remember getting a, a stern talking to by one of the customers and you know, discount is in our name, and we're talking about like putting the uh, digital displays in the showroom. And he's going, I see that, and I see the price of my tires going up. And so he's kind of like politely laying into me, <laughs> going, like, what do we got going on here? I don't want to be paying for it. I come to find out, long story short, he's, a, he's the customer who has the Jaguar in the Bay being worked on. He's got a summer or a winter home in Arizona from Wisconsin. So he, he's definitely got some of the money to be able to pay for this. But he is like, at the end of it, he goes, well, but thank you for asking. We missed that part of um, the feedback loop. And as I explained to him, too, it's like, well, what we have today is all of our promotional posters. We have to print them, and we have to ship them. Uh, we have to take the, the soft costs and labor to install them as well. So by putting these screens in there, we can have Command Central based at our uh, home office and flash something the day of. Maybe we win a race with NASCAR, and we want to do a promotion in that area. But there was definitely, as some some generations or people as they see that technology piece to it, how am I paying for this? I just wanted my tires at a discounted price. That's why I'm here today. So that was, a, it was an interesting conversation, but one where he was thankful in the end, like thanks for asking the question and then explaining as well of how it works. But yeah, definitely some pushback there. Well, and that's that break point, right? Yeah. It, it, you sometimes can get to a certain level of whether it's tech or innovation or even like fit and finish occasionally, it can, can kind of push a customer to be like, what's going on here? Like what, you know, am I paying for this? Like what? <laughs> Even internal. How many times do I have to sell to have that piece? Of like, so we get a lot of pushback in development too. It's like, what are you guys doing over there? It's like, you know, we definitely hear that same thing too. People yeah. that obviously have money sitting in the bank with us will say that same thing. But I think it comes down to explaining to them what you're doing and why you're doing it, right? You know, we're, same with the technology, explaining to them why you're freeing up time to be able to have better conversations with you. 
um, uh, we get pushback a lot on specifically closures. So hmm. sometimes we're not really doing too many, you know, wholesale closures anymore, but we're being really strategic about maybe two branches or 10 minutes apart and they're both in bad spots and moving them into one great spot that is better access for all of the customers. But sometimes they give you that pushback. Why are you moving? You're spending all this money on this branch, but kind of there's a reason behind it, right? Yeah. And being transparent about that. Yeah. There's always a reason. <laughs> And realistically, it's the cost of doing business for us, right? I, yeah. To, to your point, I can, I, I can spend uh, untold amounts of money on paper and, and you know, dis distributing all these things, or I can just put it on a screen in front of you and spend it once. Yeah. Yeah. Well, time's dwindling down here. I would love some closing thoughts on just like, Blue sky, just biggest pipe dream. What is the thing you're most excited about, either in your industry, like a potential innovation you see, or maybe something that you know hasn't even arisen yet, but you you can kind of see some some wings for, or even cross industry. Just what excites you? What are you looking forward to? Federal legalization. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I bet. <laughs> here, here. That would be transformational for our business. Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, more seriously, uh, I, I'm just excited uh, to uh, continue to innovate um, in a business that's that's new, um, and it, we're all sort of in the same boat. I tell people all the time, uh, if, if the company that I'm working for isn't growing, I don't have a job. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm very excited to continue to um, develop what a cannabis dispensary looks like and feels like and, and uh, maybe have better answers for you when we have this conversation next year sure. about... <laughs> Uh, what our what our patients and customers want and, and what our experience is. Um, I'm just very excited for the future of, uh, of what we're doing. Great. What about when flying cars are, are a thing? What are you excited about? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no, it's funny you say that because uh, the auto industry is changing quite a bit too. And um, as we talk about more electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, uh, there's all these 20, 30 goals and initiatives out there, but it's really changing our dynamic and the way we look at some of it too, because if you talk about Uber or Cruise, um, one of the autonomous vehicle groups, it, where are they going to go and is it fleet-based and are people going to have um, their own vehicles or is it going to be more of the ride-sharing or shared vehicle? Um, do we look at additional services? What are we taking on? Um, we'll continue to innovate. We can't alienate our current customers as well, but we talk about B2B, B2C. So lots of different challenges, and it's an amazing time to be doing what we're doing and trying to be at the forefront, the industry leader, with the technology component with it as well, and uh, make those relationships as well, whether it's with the auto manufacturers or these other startup companies that are trying to change the world through autonomous vehicles. So that's huge on our radar, and we'll continue to kind of change as time goes on too. Exciting. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, like we've been talking about, the whole conference retail is at this piv pivotal turning point, and I think banking is right up there, if not even more so. It's such an old industry, but really kind of trying to figure out what we're going to do with it in the future is very exciting. It's an exciting position to be in. Um, really, you know, the crux of what we're trying to figure out right now is what do the physical branch space mean to us and to our customers for the future? Being more flexible and learning and growing with our customers as they're needs change, and as we talk about cost, how can we do that in an economical way, making sure that we're being thoughtful and strategic about designs that are easy to be flexible with our customers, um, and how do we you know, think about future-proofing spaces to be able to incorporate new technology, new ideas, um, new needs as customers grow and change. Um, you know, Especially disruptors in the industry, obviously there's a lot of fintechs out there that we're kind of dealing with, um, all sorts of people getting into banking now, so being kind of just thoughtful about making sure that we, you know, know what our business means and partnering with some of those fintechs where it makes sense. Awesome. Well, I'm super excited for just brands to be taking risks in general and kind of doing fun new stuff. It's, it's always exciting as a 
designer to see what else is out there and what kind of feathers we can ruffle, so <laughs> in a good way. Awesome. Well, I think that's all we got for you today. Perfect. Yeah, hopefully you enjoyed, and it's been great chatting with you guys. Yeah, cheers. <laughs>